Hallelujah. So listen, tonight we're going to, uh, we're taking a little detour for a little bit. Uh, we just finished in time teaching that probably lasted over a year, or it seems like it take, took us at least a year to get through it. We just finished the book of Revelation, but we did stuff having to do with the Nephilim before that, territorial spirits and different things like that. But here we are now. So we're taking a little bit of a break before we go back to the New Testament. And I wanted to get into the book of Romans a little bit. You know, one of the things about the book of Romans is that whenever Rob and I a long time ago, or not just Rob, but Rob, well, it was me and Rob walking in a park in, at the park one, one day. Uh, so that was the premise of why the church started was we started, uh, he, wanted, he wanted to talk more about the Bible because him and, him and Wade had been talking whenever they used to be real close. Uh, about the book of Romans and about what true righteousness meant and, and the message of the cross. And so, you know, whenever I started talking to him about it, and he knew it was something that he had heard before. He said, man, I want to hear more about this. So we started a Bible study, and that's really where we started. And to be honest with you, this is this, what we're about to get into over the next few weeks uh, has to do with what we believe to be the foundation of, of what really got us started. And it's what set me free in my Christian walk as a I could say my, my dad used to use this word a lot, mediocrity or mediocre, which means average at best. And uh, he, he said, son, whatever you do, don't be mediocre at it, you know. But, but as a Christian, I believe that I was mediocre at best for about 12 years, you know. And then in the midst of my struggle and the things that I was facing, the Lord showed up and he spoke some things to me. I could keep you here all night and talk to you about it, but make it simple he spoke something to my heart one night, and he said that you will present my word for the way that it is written, and then I will use you. And so I didn't even have a clue what that meant. And so the Lord brought me down this journey, and so now here we are. And so we're going to talk about some of these things over the next few weeks uh, that really... Now, <laughs> the main emphasis of what we're talking about, when we start talking about the cross, you got to understand I'm not talking about two pieces of wood. Many of you already understand that. That is the instrument upon which Jesus died. The altar here represents the cross because the Old Testament altar where the sacrifice was offered up as a, as a sacrifice unto God was also an instrument of death just like the cross is. When you come to the altar in a church, you know, part of what you're saying is, Lord, less of me and more of you, right? You're humbling yourself in the presence of your king. And, and that's, that's part of what, what the cross is about. But whenever I say the cross, we're re what we're really talking about, at least if we're not talking about salvation, we're talking about how does a person grow in Christ. We're talking about sanctification. What does that mean? The process of being made holy. Listen, the day that you believed in Jesus, you became holy. Do y'all you, you believe that? Do you understand? That's what the Word of God says. We're going to get into that a little bit tonight. I'm, I'm, I, listen, the enemy is always going to lie to you, and he's going to whisper to you, and sometimes he's going to scream at you, and he's going to try to convince you that you're not holy, that you're not righteous, but that's not what the Word of God says. If you're born again tonight. And that's a, that's a big thing right there, too, if you're born again. And I mean that with all sincerity because I've, I've tried to work through this a whole lot and I always go back to the Word of God. And I just, I got to tell you that I don't believe that everybody that raises their hand at Vacation Bible School and, and recites a prayer is always born again. I'm just going to be real with you because I know what the Word of God says. The Word of God says in Ephesians 1.13 that when you believe from your heart that word that was preached to you, when you believed it, you received, I'm going to just paraphrase it in modern day English, a down payment of the Holy Spirit that was a down payment until the final redemption, which means when you receive your glorified body. So when you truly get saved or become a born again believer, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit is deposited on the inside of you. And listen, when the Holy Spirit moves into the inside of you, you can always have more of the Holy Spirit, praise God. We want more of the Holy, I don't know about you, I want more of the Holy Spirit. I want to be filled to overflowing, amen? Because look, when I'm filled to overflowing, then the only thing coming out of me is Jesus. Because I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit's all about Jesus. He will take, Jesus said, he will take of what is mine and he will show it unto you. The minute, one of the main ministries of the Holy Spirit is to present Jesus to a lost and a dying world. Amen? So whenever, whenever you get saved, though, and the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, that's when you know that you're born again because you'll never be the same. Uh, that doesn't mean that you, and for various reasons, we don't have time to exhaust them all, but that doesn't mean that you'll never go the wrong way once you get 
give your life to the Lord. You know, and it doesn't mean that you won't find yourself in the midst of struggles. And sometimes it's because you got a demonic attack on your back. And sometimes it's because the sinful nature on the inside of you, we're not even going to get into that. You, you have a sinful nature that you receive from your father, Adam, and that thing will not be eradicated until you get to glory and you receive your glorified body. Amen. So I just want to tell you, but, but, but what we're talking about is, when we're talking about the cross, we're talking about sanctification or looking more like the Lord. Really what the word sanctification means is to be made holy, to be separated unto God. Amen? See, there's a lot of people that are saved, and for whatever reason, we don't have time to exhaust it tonight, for whatever reason, they're not sanctified. They're not, and I don't mean that in a self-righteous way. I mean, their lips still sound like the world. <laughs> if your lips still sound like the world, Houston, we have a problem. We're not supposed to sound like that. Well, what are you saying, pre? No, it's a process. Calm down. I'm not trying to tell you you were supposed to woke, wake up this morning and look at nothing. That's not what I'm trying to get at. But I am trying to make sure that we're all on the same page. Christians talk different than the world. Christians act different than the world. Christians do different stuff than what the world does. Because if we keep on doing it just like the world, then there's no distinction or difference between the people of God and the people of the world. And how will the world ever know? That there's a real people that love God and want to live for him. Amen? All right, so what I want to talk to you about tonight is this concept of righteousness. The righteousness of God. That's really the main emphasis of my, of my little short message tonight, righteousness. I want, you to, I want you to think about that. That's really the main point I'm trying to get across to you tonight. The righteousness of God. Amen? And look, we're going to... We're going to go, the first passage of scripture we're going to go to is going to be in Romans chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 19 through 21. You can go there if you want. You can hold your finger there. But listen, before we even go there, I want to, I want to do this. See that little pivot point right there? Because I want you to understand righteousness is the pivot point of Christianity. I, I can't even begin to explain to you the importance of the concept of that word righteousness. Listen to me. Without righteousness you won't get into the kingdom of God. Without righteousness, I'm not talking, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. We're not talking about righteousness as regards religion. We're talking about the right kind of righteousness. Well, what are you talking about? I'm going to introduce you to, to righteousness tonight. He's got a name. His name is Jesus. And I got good news for you. God the Father wants you to partake in the righteousness of his son. So, but before we get into Romans 3, 19 through 21, like I said, I want to talk to you about righteousness a little bit. I use uh, some fancy words there. Y'all remember antonyms? Y'all learned about that in school, didn't you? Come on, somebody. Y'all learned about antonyms and synonyms. And what is an antonym? An antonym is what? The opposite of what you're talking about. So if we're talking about righteousness, I just wanted to share a few little biblical antonyms of righteousness with you here real quick. You ready? Here we go. Boom. Guilt. Guilt is the opposite of righteousness. See, when you're walking in righteousness, you're no longer guilty. When you have received the righteousness of the Christ, I know I've said it many times, but that's not his last name. His name is Jesus the Christ. The Christ means the anointed one. He's talk, we're talking about the one that the prophets foretold that he would come. The Hebrew word is Messiah. The Greek word is Christ, Christos, the anointed one, the promised one, the prophets foretold. And listen, he came. He's got righteousness. He's got healing in his wings. He wants to heal the people of God. So listen, once you've received the righteousness of Christ, you're no longer guilty. Guilt is the opposite, right? Look at this, unclean. Boy, I tell you, there's a whole lot that can come off of that word unclean. We can use that word unclean in so many different ways, both Old Testament, New Testament. We couldn't even exhaust it. I got the word leper in here too, but I've shared before when I've preached on lepers, what did they have to do? They had to walk around and scream, unclean, unclean, because they were contagious and they were diseased and, and they had to let people know that they were unclean so that they wouldn't spread their, their infection to other people. But look, leprosy throughout the scriptures is a type of sin, all right? The leper, there you go, specifically. You know how much biblical, biblical information there is just connected to the leper? I mean, there's a lot of biblical information. I mean, I preached on naming the leper a little while ago. 
a little while back. And then look at the, the lepers that showed themselves to Jesus. And what did, what did both of those stories have in common? A little bit of like what I'm trying to talk to you about tonight, righteousness. Because, see, when Naaman the leper got, got saved, I was about to say got saved, when he got dunked in the water, when he finally listened and he got dunked in the water and he came up the seventh time, what does the Bible say? His skin was like that of a young child. And, and, and that is a type of being born again, being born anew in Christ. And the lepers that came to Jesus, they were made new. They were made whole, or at least the one that came back, you're made whole. And, and so we see that if leprosy is a type of sin, then a healed leper is a type of salvation and being made clean in the eyes of God. Look at that. You, can you read that? That's a weird-looking font. It's supposed to say swine, pigs. Pigs are an unclean animal. According to the Old Testament, a pig is an unclean animal. Oh, he's going to go preaching against eating pork. No, I don't, I don't, you eat all the pork you want to eat. I know Aaron's back there saying, don't call me out, Matt. Aaron don't like pork. I don't really blame him. Sometimes it's kind of gross if you think about it. They don't sweat. They exude some kind of weird stuff out of their little split hoof or whatever it is. But nevertheless, a swine, biblically speaking, is an unclean animal. Isn't it interesting how the demons, I was listening to it today, Matthew chapter 8, I believe it was, where they said, let us go into the swine. Have you not ever wondered? I, I, I was just sitting there. I was working out in my room. I love my little tonal thing. And I was listening to the Bible, and I was like, oh, here's that story right here. And Jesus, they said, this man's full of demons. And they're like, what do we have to do with you, old son of God, you know, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come before the appointed time? See, they know. The demon spirits know that their day is coming. And there's a reckoning that's going to happen. But you've come before the appointed time. This isn't fair. The the penalty flag's got to be thrown. It's not time. Now, Jesus ain't playing by their rules. And he said, let us go into the swine. See, unclean things like unclean things. But I never did really understand because probably just because the forces of evil are so confused themselves through sin. Because does not sin deceive and cause confusion? It does. They wanted to go into the swine and then all of a sudden they caused the swine to run off into the water. And again, this is the first time I've ever thought of this. I got to have more time to think about it. But it hit me for the first time. I always wondered what in the world... Why? What, what does this even mean? And you know what I personally think now? I could be wrong. I ain't got no way to prove it. That, that was, that, they, you know, the enemy wants sacrifice too. You, you understand what I'm saying? The enemy wants sacrifice. And, the, and, and a demon spirit wants to live inside of some kind. But they ain't really wanting to live in no pig. I got to be honest with you. A demon spirit don't want to live in a pig. He wants to live in a human body. He wants to live in a person. He wants to use that person as a vessel. The devil wants to use human beings as vessels just as the Holy Spirit desires to use human beings as vessels that he can speak his truth through. The devil wants to use human beings that he can manifest his lies through. So really and truly, them demons didn't want to live in them pigs. I personally believe that that was a way for them to offer up some kind of lion sacrifice to to the God of the pit that they come from. That's just... That's just a little commentary. That I didn't get that from the Word. That's just something that I, because that I, I know how they work to some extent. I've read about them, and that's the kind of stuff they do. Anyway, that was the swine, unclean. I'm trying to give you some antonyms of righteousness, the fowl, the fowl of the air. You remember that? Whenever God cut covenant with Abraham, what happened? God caused Abraham to fall asleep under the tree. Abraham cut those carcasses in half, amen, and Abraham's over there sleeping under the tree, which is a t- Abraham's cutting covenant with God, which is going to be the fulfillment of Jesus coming. That was thousands of years before Jesus would come. And what happened? The fowl of the air come and tried to steal the carcasses. The fowl of the air always like leprosy and also like we hadn't got there yet, leaven, types of sin, types of the works of darkness trying to steal the things of God from the people of God. But in there, in there again in the parable of the sower in the New Testament, did we not hear that? The sower went out to sow and some of the seed fell along the wayside. What happened? The fowl of the air came to try to steal the seed so that the seed of the truth couldn't be planted inside of the heart and that new life could come. So there you go. There's there's the opposite of righteousness, the foul, demonic spirits, unclean spirits. How many times does it talk about that in the King James Version? Demonic spirits. And then tombs, right? The man of Gadarene was living amongst the tombs, cutting himself. You know, I know I've shared this with you all a lot before, but I hate to say it, but it just is what it is. 
whenever people cut themselves, that's, that's straight up de- demonic. I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, you know, and, and, and it's pushed through modern society, through the music of modern society. And, and anyway, but the, but the point is, you know, I, I'm, as a nurse practitioner, I go to these conferences and I can't help myself. And I'll say, but have you ever thought about that, about demonic possession, demonic, whatever you want to call it? Uh, that, that these people, are because see, I got two biblical evidences of people cutting themselves directly connected to demonic spirits. And, and, and it's in Elijah with the showdown with the prophets of Baal, the man of Gadarene. So in the tombs, it's unclean, it's dead bodies. That's why Jesus called the Pharisees, you're like a bunch of whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. The outside is painted and pretty, but the inside is full of dead men's bones. See, and according to the book of Leviticus, if you touch the dead man, then you were unclean for seven days, right? So death was unclean. The tombs were unclean. Leaven, the type of yeast, was well, a word that means yeast, and yeast was a type of sin. And so all of these things I'm just wanting you to see are the opposite of righteousness. And I'm just trying to give you an idea that this stuff transcends throughout the whole Bible, and I'm wanting you to understand That righteousness, when I say righteousness is the pivot point, mankind, listen, when we're talking about these things, we're going back to Adam. We might not even mention Adam tonight, but he is mentioned in Romans chapter 5 because Adam is the source of the human race. No, God is the source of the human race, but Adam is the source, the father of sinful man. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? The first time you're born physically, you're born of your father, Adam, and you're born in sin with a sinful nature. That's why we must be born again. And whenever we're born again, now we we receive the spirit of God. Hallelujah. We become partakers of the divine nature. That's just the beginning. You do understand, though, that your sinful nature will not be completely eradicated until you go home to glory. But... Normal Christianity is not supposed to be where your sinful nature is more powerful than the Spirit of God operating in your life. That is not normal Christianity. I don't care what anybody told you. I don't care that normal Christianity is that we would walk in victory, freedom, liberty because Jesus paid a high price for us to be able to have that. Amen. And the Holy Spirit moves through what Jesus has already accomplished. All right, so listen, Adam. I got Adam on both sides of righteousness. So what are you talking about? Because, see, when Adam was created, he was created in the image and likeness of God. And, I, and God has no sin. Amen? God has no sin. So when Adam was created, when he was formed from the clay of the ground and life was breathed into him, he was created in the image and likeness of God or in the the likeness and the image of God. But whenever he fell, he's on the other side of righteousness now. And again, all of us as his offspring are born with a sinful nature. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, if that bothers you, because I've had had a lot of conversations with a lot of Christians through the years, and they're like, but I'm created in the image and likeness of God. Well, yeah, you are. But technically, while you, were, while you as a man were created in the image and likeness of God because Adam, your father, was created in the image and likeness of God, according to Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, you were born like Seth in the image and likeness of your father, Adam. Period. Word of God, I didn't make that up. So the first time that we're told after the fall of Adam that Adam had another offspring, his name was Seth, He was born in the image and likeness of his father, Adam. Adam now is in a fallen state. The human race is in a bind. God cannot accept sin. So therefore, God has a plan of righteousness. So he sends the righteous one. (laughs) But he's been spending thousands of years of human history getting us to the point where Jesus shows up on the scene. Amen. And I want you to know that it's important for us to realize how dedicated God is to his plan and also to you being part of his plan. Amen? All right. Now, before we go to, the, to that one, let's go to, to uh, this Romans chapter 3, verse 19. So I wanted you to see here. He says, now we know what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Now, before we move on, because I really wanted to get you to verse 21, I want you to look at this real close with me. 
And I'm going to, you know, I don't know that you're going to feel comfortable talking, but if you do, I wish we had a microphone back there. We could get y'all to talk because now, you know, now that everything's like running, funneling straight into the system. And so people can't hear y'all back there, but maybe I'll repeat it if you have a statement. It says, now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them that are under the law. What does that mean to you when you hear that? It says that to them who are under the law. Kind of like so far a rhetorical question just because like for the longest time when I worked in the oil field, I can remember when I was trying to learn about God, trying to read the Bible. I love the book of Romans. I can remember sitting in my bunk trying to read the Bible, specifically reading the book of Romans in the midst of all these guys trying to make me watch pornography with them. Lord help us. But nevertheless, I'm sitting here reading. And anytime I would come to the law, I was like, well, he's not talking about me anymore. And I would just flip through the pages. See? Because the law was for the Old Testament Jew, and so the law didn't have anything to do with me. So I would just kind of bypass that and move on to the next step. But I want you to see something a little bit different. I want you to, I want you to understand that the law really, if you're not a born-again believer, the law is for, for them. The law is, what I'm trying to say is this, and this goes along with something that the Lord showed me a couple of weeks ago that I shared with y'all. And it shouldn't have been that much of a revelation, but it, it kind of is. That this earth belongs to him. Hello. Wake up, Carl. This rock called earth belongs to him. It doesn't, it doesn't belong to the transgender uh, movement. It doesn't belong to the LBGTQ movement. No, 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 no. It doesn't belong to all the evilness and the wickedness that's out there in the world today. This earth, this rock we call earth belongs to to God and everything on it belongs to God and God's saying, but so when God brings the law into existence, that means that he's going to judge people either, either according to the law or they're going to be judged under the law. It's not God's fault that mankind isn't paying attention to his word. Does that make sense? All right, let me go back. Let me go back a little bit further for you. Let me go back to, uh, to, uh, where is this scripture that I wanted to share with you? Romans 2, 28. Romans 2, 28 through, through chapter 3, verse 2. Look at, look at what it says. He is not a Jew. This is the Apostle Paul talking about the Jews. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. Now, we've, we've been talking about this kind of stuff for quite some time, so we should not be completely ignorant. We understand, and I'm not trying to be weird here. It's kind of uncomfortable, but a circumcision is when the foreskin of a, of a male's private anatomy is cut off. Okay, that was a sign for the Old Testament Jew that they were in covenant with God. Okay, so the Apostle Paul is saying that a true Jew isn't one that says he's a Jew outwardly, and neither is true circumcision that which is outward of what we just talked about, that procedure just now. But that instead, in the book of Romans, it talks about a circumcision that is done with the hand of God upon the heart of man. See, God will perform a surgical procedure, if you'd let me say it like that, where he circumcises the heart of man. So, so he, the true Jew, is one that is inward. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So a true Jew is not something that's outward. It's not some, it's not some medical or, or clean procedure that an Old Testament Jew. Paul gives us updated, revelatory information and says, hey, circumcision was just a type in the Old Testament. True circumcision is when the Spirit of God does a work on the inside of your heart and he transforms you inwardly. That's what a true Jew is, all right? So then he says, what advantage then is there to being a Jew? Or what profit is there to, to circumcision? I want you to think about this. This is so powerful. There's so much. I could, I'm telling you we could preach for two hours just on this. Because when you understand the big picture of God, when you understand the puzzle that all these pieces are coming together to make, you begin to see what advantage is there of the Jew? What profit is there of circumcision? Look what he says. Much in every way. Why, Paul? Chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. <laughs> You're not as excited as I thought you were going to be. Why not? 
I don't know. Maybe we need to wake up from our nap. Maybe we need to crack the book back open. Maybe we need to start reading more. Maybe we need to understand that mankind before the nation of Israel was created was dark and it was black. And then the time frame of the flood and the fallen angels would create Nephilim upon the earth and then the Tower of Babel and the rebellion. And then you turn the page. Hallelujah. God calls a man named Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. And through this man, he promises all nations of the earth are going to be blessed through your seed. And Paul says in Galatians, he didn't say seeds as of many. He said seed as of one, and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Unto them was committed the oracles of God. Because if he wouldn't have given the oracles of God to the Jewish people, you and I would be still in darkness. Boy, I wish we had really time to talk about some of the stuff we've been learning in that book because that's some powerful stuff. How God, because of the disobedience of men at the Tower of Babel, willingly worshiping false gods and saying, we don't want you to be our God. We want to worship these false gods. God, according to Deuteronomy 32 and Psalm 82, allows mankind and the nations to be brought under the leadership of false gods. And they got all their own little oracles now. Lying words that cause people to be deceived, keep people in darkness. But then, but then in, in Deuteronomy 32 is what he says, but Jacob was God's allotted portion. God kept a peace for himself. He created his own nation out of this one man named Abraham, and he promised through him he would give the world Messiah, hallelujah, the righteous one. Thank you, Jesus. So that, yeah, guess what? If you got Jewish heritage, that's a beautiful thing. But if you ain't saved, you, you just as dead and, and dying as the next guy, as a pagan on the side of you. Sorry. Don't be giving all your money to bring all them Jewish people back home. Give your money to some preacher that's going to preach the truth of the gospel. Because if they feeding Jewish people and putting them back in their home, we don't even have time to get into all that right now because that's a whole mess. Like what the kids say now, that's a hot mess right there because I got to tell you, there's a whole lot of stuff going on with that that ain't even reality. Now, you don't have to like me. A lot of people don't. I'm just here to try to tell you the truth, the best that I can understand it. And what I'm here to tell you is you need to find, if you're going to give your money to something, you need to find yourself a preacher that's going to preach the truth, that's going to preach Jesus to Jewish people so that Jewish people can be saved. Amen. That's the word of the Lord. Because they all, because look, the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians, he said, he made two one through the blood that was shed. There's not two ways to salvation, one for the Jew, one for the Gentile. No, one way through the cross. Amen. All right, so let's go back to Romans chapter 3. And then we're going to, we're hitting verse 19. I wanted to make that point that the law wasn't just for the Jew, but the law now See, whenever God, and this is another thing that I was thinking even a little, drilling a little bit deeper today while I was like listening to the Bible and things and studying and whatnot, and I was thinking, you know, because this earth belongs to God and because God created his own allotted portion called Jacob and because to them he gave the oracles of God and because to them in the wilderness he gave them the law, guess what? God is holding the whole world accountable. Whether they want to read his word or not, the law is in existence, my friend, and they will be judged by the law. They will either have their judgment placed on Jesus Christ or they will be judged according to the law. But I wasn't a Jew. It don't matter whether you were a Jew. This place belongs to God. The word He gave the word of God to the world whether they wanted it or not, he gave his revelation in his life. Good news, good news. You don't have to be judged according to the law because if that was the case, we'd all be in a world of hurt. He says, now we know that the things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be become guilty before God. <laughs> That's a good point. God is saying, I gave, one of the reasons God gave the law was to prove to everyone that they were going to be guilty. Because as soon as, listen, <laughs> the self-righteous person can't see it because they're so hypocritical. They're so self-righteous. They think they're so holy. They can't see their own heart, right? Okay, but according to the law, you will become guilty if you're willing to read the law for what it really says. Because the law says that if you don't accomplish the whole thing, then you're guilty in all of it. He says he will become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight 
For by the law is the knowledge of sin. There's another reason God gave the law. He wanted to show us what was sin and what was righteousness. See, God is righteousness. And when he gives his law, you can go through the law. You can read it. You can memorize it. The more you understand the law, look, there's some value in the law. To understand the law will show you God's heart. It will give you a peek into his mind of what he says is right and what he says is wrong. Now, in order to try to keep the law, that's a whole different story. You need Jesus living in your heart to even try. <laughs> Amen? Because if you try and according to your own strength, man, you're going to be made a mockery. Amen? Now, verse 29, 21, this is really the, the pivot point right here. I want you to see this. I love this verse. This is I say it all the time, but I think this is one of my favorite verses of the Bible right here. Look, so the righteousness of God was revealed to the world through the law. But look what Paul says. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. That's so beautiful. Do you, do you even see what he's, already, what he's preparing you for right here? He's preparing to introduce you to a man named Jesus. <laughs> He's trying to prepare you to be introduced to the righteousness of God. He has a name, and his name is Jesus. He says, now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. What is he saying? The Old Testament told you that he was coming. Even the righteousness of God, look at this, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So guess what? Good news. God gave the law to prove to man that he couldn't keep it and that he was going to be sinful in the eyes of God because he would break the law. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law has been revealed. And what he's talking about is it was revealed in Jesus. Amen. Don't you... Whenever you study the Bible, you know, whenever you look at stuff like this, you're supposed to not, we're, suppo we're supposed to not just, just scroll through it. We're supposed to, what is, when we don't understand something, we're supposed to try to stop and ponder. And whenever, whenever, G, whenever Paul says that, he says, you know, if he says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Do you understand that when Paul's writing this, that Jesus is kind of new? You understand? And he's in the midst of a society, a civilization. Yes, people are getting saved. The Roman church is growing and Christians are dying and the words out on the street about Jesus. But this is very, very new. And, and the Jewish faith had been around for a long time. And, and he's trying to even help Jewish people to understand that your own law and prophets witnessed and told you that he was coming. I'm here to tell you that he's come and that his name is Jesus and and that he is the righteousness of God. Amen? Well, praise God. So the next thing that I wanted you to see was this next verse that comes out of Romans chapter 4, verse 3. And it says, For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. I want you to understand this, that, that really if, if righteousness is the pivot point that changes our guilt to being acceptable in the eyes of God. Let's just put it that way. Righteousness from God, which was given to us by Jesus, is what makes us acceptable in the eyes of God. Amen? Without that righteousness, we cannot be acceptable in the eyes of God. But, but one thing I want you to see here is that word counted, because it's a, it's an, it's an, a mathematical term. It, the word in the Greek is logizomai, where we get the word logarithm. And the idea is, is this, is that if you, it, he put it into your account. See, before you knew Jesus and you were born of your father Adam, you were born in sin and you had no righteousness. If you were here the other night, Sister Cheryl made a comment about us being at enmity with God. What she was talking about is before we come to Christ... We're at enmity with God because we're separated from him because we don't have righteousness. Instead, we have guilt and sin. But whenever we're like Abraham and we believe God, then what does God do? He puts righteousness into our account. Amen. That's good stuff right there. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. It's like, in other words, Jesus has already paid the debt and the, and the ATM is full of his righteousness. Amen. The ATM is full of his righteousness, and the pin number is try the cross. 
try the cross. You go to the ATM, you press in, try the cross, and start spitting out righteousness. Because Jesus has already paid for it. But the problem that we have is that many times people don't believe enough just to even go to the ATM and punch in the words, try the cross. And then they, they, oh, I've already tried to cross. I remember, I know I shared the story a lot. Me and Aaron went to Bourbon Street with that dude Lance, and we were carrying the cross. And I don't even know if Aaron remembers or not, but some dude was like, I already tried Jesus. I already tried Jesus. And Aaron says, no, dude. Jesus isn't a pair of shoes that you try him on, and then you just throw him back in the closet. It doesn't work that way. You don't try Jesus. You bow your knee to Jesus. You give your heart to Jesus. You accept him. You plead with him. You cry out to him, and you say, please, Jesus, save me, a sinner, and you punch in the ATM, try the cross, and then righteousness is dispensed to you because Jesus already paid for it, and your faith is the pin number. See, Abraham believed God, and into his account was placed righteousness. Now, real quick, I just wanted to ask this question. What did Abraham believe God in? What did Abraham believe God for? I mean, there's a lot that Abraham did and believed God, right? But, but let me just say this. Abraham believed God. Now, he, did he have some mistakes in his life, some hiccups? You better believe it. But we're not going to get into that right now. But I just want to tell you some things that I've thought about a lot through the years, some of the things that Abraham did believe God for. One time God told Abraham, step outside your tent and look up here at the stars. I want you to see the number of the stars. So shall your descendants be. Dude, that's a beautiful thing. Because not just the Jewish people, and we ain't going to talk about Islam, please. But not because that was a work of the flesh. <laughs> Ishmael was a product of the flesh. Understand that, child of God. You, you can't just take matters into your own hands and think you're not going to have repercussions. It, so we're not even going to talk about. We're 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 going to talk God told Abraham to cut that covenant with him. Abraham believed God. He cut the carcasses of those animals, and he spread them. And the Bible says that God walked through like fire through those carcasses. Abraham believed that, that even though Isaac was as good as dead, that God had the power to raise him again from the dead. Dude, that's powerful. Because, look, I preach it a lot, but I'm here to tell you, Abraham understood to some extent, what he was getting into. Y'all remember when the Pharisees in John chapter 8, well, let's go ahead and go there. I didn't have it playing. Y'all still with me? I don't, I'm not going to keep you here too long, I promise. What did we say it was? John chapter 8, 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 Look at this, man. Look at the Jews. The Jews an then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that you are a Samaritan and have a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeks and judges. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keeps my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know you have a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets also. And you say, if a man keeps my saying, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets who are dead? Who make yourself to be? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him. But I know him, and if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like you. I mean, dude, really? I, do you not, like, get, I mean, does this not kind of tickle you a little bit to see how the Lord is dealing with these folks? This is serious business, man. People, like, just putting Jesus in a box and saying he's just all calm. Jesus is going to tell them like it is. Jesus speaks truth. I know him not, I shall be a liar like you, but I know him and I keep his saying. Look at this. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Hallelujah. 
I mean, you, know, you got to really kind of think about this because you got to understand. That's why I draw the little lines on the chronology thing. Abraham was 2000 B.C., 2,000 years before Jesus ever walked the face of the earth. The Bible says, Jesus says, your father Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. Now, I prayed a lot, and I still can't prove it, but I believe this is the answer right here. When did Abraham see the day of the Lord? Galatians chapter 3 says this. Paul says this in Galatians. He says, God foreseeing that he would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel in advance to Abraham. Now, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. There was a day whenever God told Abraham to take your son, your only son, and bring him up on a mountain that I will show you, and there you will sacrifice him for me. And what did, God, what did, God, what did the Bible say? The Bible says Abraham laid wood on the lad's back. I mean, if you can't see a picture of Calvary right here, then we're having a hard time communicating the gospel. So 2,000 years before Jesus ever shows up on the face of the earth, Father Abraham takes his supernatural son, lays wood on his back, and tells him, now let's go climb up this mountain. And young Isaac says, Father, I see the fire, and I see the wood, but where's the sacrifice? He says, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. The book of Hebrews tells us that Abraham knew that Isaac was as good as dead, but that he believed that God could resurrect him, raise him. Listen, Abraham had a promise given to him by God. He said, you promised me offspring, and all I have is this Eliezer in my house, and, the Lord, and, and is, won't you bless Ishmael? God said, no, it ain't coming out of Ishmael, my friend. No, 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 he will be a supernatural birth. His name shall be Isaac. And, and God and Abraham brings that boy up on that hill. And at the last minute, he's about to thrust the knife in his son, own son's chest. God is not about human sacrifice. God abhors human sacrifice. That's the devil's job. He's trying to make a point. And at the last moment, before he thrusts that knife in that young boy's chest, there's a ram caught in the thicket. Hallelujah. A sacrifice, waiting. And from that day forward, you know what that mountain was called? Jehovah Jireh. God provides. I got good news for you. God provides, my friend. He provided a lamb, a ram on that day. He provided a sacrifice. And God now is explaining to us through all of this. I believe this. I can't prove it, but I believe there was a little offset commentary between God and Abraham. You, don't, you didn't have to do that, son. I mean, you did what I asked you to do. My plan all along was to provide a sacrifice. And let me tell you why I did this, because this is what I'm going to do. Through you, and when I tell you all seeds of all nations of the earth are going to be blessed through your seed, and the apostle Paul says he didn't say seeds as of many, but one, his name is Jesus, I'm going to give the world my offspring, my supernatural son. I'm going to put wood on his back, and I'm going to cause him to walk up a hill. And there I'm going to sacrifice him. Because when I created Adam out of this pristine earth, there was no sin in him. There was no curse in the dirt. And when I breathed my life-giving power into him, he was created in my image and my likeness, but he took sin into himself. And now the entirety of the human race is, finds himself in sin. But I got a plan. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. I'm going to send my son. Born of uncorruptible seed, the word of God becoming flesh, and he will die in place of sinful man. Because you see, the wages of sin is death. Somebody had to die. I told that Muslim woman that time, you know, I was witnessing to her. I said, somebody had to die. I said, Muhammad said in the Hadith, which is a commentary of the Quran, that with one drop of the martyr's blood, his all sin is atoned. I said, ma'am, he was tainted with sin. His blood can't atone for sin. Your blood can't atone for sin, ma'am. My blood. Jesus is the one that atoned for sin. Because he had no sin. The wages of sin is death. He was the only one that could pay the wage. Praise God. So what did, I, what did Abraham believe God for? He believed that God could give him as many descendants in the stars as the stars of the sky. He believed that, that God would, would send his only begotten son as much as he understood it. I don't know exactly what he understood, but he understood enough that Jesus said, Abraham saw my day, he saw it, and he rejoiced. 
And in the Hebrew, and in the Greek language where Jesus is talking about that, the idea is I'm not going to do it because I'll make myself look like a fool. He was twirling. He was jumping and he was twirling around. I wish I could still do that, but I think I'm going to look dumb. So, He was jumping and he was twirling because have you ever been ecstatic, excited about something and you're overwhelmed with emotion? I mean, can you imagine how Abraham felt? I need to keep moving, but just try to put yourself on that Mount Moriah right there. Like, you've been waiting for God to give you this son, and he finally gives you this son, and then now he tells you to go sacrifice him, and you're about to do it because you know God called you out of Ur of the Chaldees. I'm talking about southern Iraq. There was no nation called Israel. There were just scattered people that knew God, but God spoke to him. What did that sound like? Enough to make him pack his bags and get up and get out. We know from the word of God that his father was a maker of idols. You can Google it. I've said it before, teraphims. His daddy's name was Tera. You can Google T-E-R-A-P-H-I-M-S, teraphims. It means household God. Gods were named after Abraham's daddy. Okay? Uh, and listen, he was a maker of idols. Abraham didn't know the God of glory. He called him out of that house, and Abraham believed him. And, 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 and walked the journey, believing that God was able to do what he promised he would do. And now we have a world that we live in that's been enlightened with the light of Jesus. Thank God. Have you ever imagined what this world would be like without Jesus? Could you imagine the darkness? Listen, I, I don't... I, sometimes I got too much bumping around in my head, and I just need to try to look, filter it out. But if you think of the world and how dark it was when Jesus showed up, it was bad. The Spirit had not descended. The Spirit was not living on the inside of people's heart. People were, people were polluted by the, by the religion of the Pharisees. They weren't leading God's people in the right direction. They were extorting God's people. They were actually, I believe, practitioners of occult magic. I believe that. They were practicing the mystery religions, Kabbalah. Th them people, I keep saying this, and I know y'all probably don't believe me, and I'm just going to keep saying it until somebody starts believing me. Them people, they got them little ringlet things in their hair, and they over there at the Wailing Wall. That's not even real Judaism. That's, they're practicing Kabbalah. That's ancient Jewish mysticism. That's the furthest thing from true Judaism. Anyway, the world was full of sin. It was dark, but God sent Jesus the light. Amen. Aren't you happy you have access to the light? Sometimes we take advantage of that, right? We in America, we're kind of spoiled. We've been, oh, man, no, oh, here we go. I done heard about Jesus however many times. I don't want to hear that story no more. No, you better start listening, my friend. There's going to be a time whenever the time runs out, grace ends, and then judgment's coming. I'm not trying to freak nobody out, but it's, listen, it's, it's going to happen. The time will run out. But in the meantime, work while it's day. The night comes when no man can work, amen. Let us work. Let us tell others about Jesus. Let, it, let his righteousness settle in our hearts, amen, and let him change us so that we got a message to speak to others. All right, so Abraham believed God, and God put righteousness in his account. Now, just real quick. To him that works, the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, if you could work your way towards holiness, then God would owe you something, right? But God doesn't owe man anything. God already gave Jesus. As a matter of fact, I think that's my next, well, no, this, this kind of explains a little bit more. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. I want, you know, we could spend a lot of time on this, but look, you can't work yourself to holiness. <clears throat> and when I say work yourself, sometimes people think, I used to think this, and I mean, this was a major revelation, but I used to think that because I was struggling in my walk with God, I used to think that in order for me to be made right with God, I had to read more Bible, go to church more, pray more pray in the spirit more. And listen, let me make myself clear so that you, I don't want anybody putting words in my mouth because it aggravates me when that happens. Christians read their Bible. Christians go to church. Christians, at some point in time when they're exposed to the truth, want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
once you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to want to pray in other tongues. Okay, all these things are true. Okay, but guess what? If you think that by the doing of those things, you're going to be made more righteous in the eyes of God, you got your focus all wrong. Our focus is supposed to be on the work Jesus did. And when we rest in that, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. For my burden is easy, my yoke is light, paraphrasing. right? And you will find rest for your weary soul. So we're over here working, working, working. And Jesus is saying, but won't you put my yoke upon you? Because, see, I already did the work. Let me plow. You just follow me. Follow me. Amen. All right. So you don't work, but believe. Now, once you believe, then you're going to work, right? I mean, once you believe right, okay, just imagine yourself bound up, all right? You're bound up, and you've been trying, and you've been striving, okay? Yeah, you know, I do believe that, some, that many times we could, the, the enemy is trying to attack us, okay? But, it, but at the same time, if we don't even understand how to walk in truth, then the message of the cross is not even operating for us. And we're over here trying to work to make ourselves more right in the eyes of God. And I'm just going to read more, and I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to finally make God happy. And the whole time, whenever Jesus was baptized and he came out the water, the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my Son. In him I am well pleased. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, he said the same thing. And then he said, Listen to him. And so the Lord really just wants us to focus on Jesus and to believe that Jesus is the one that he sent to heal all our disease, to heal us, to deliver us, to set us free. And if we will begin to believe that, then the Holy Spirit moves in like a flood and begins to change everything. I've seen it. Don't tell me it's not true. I can prove it to you from the scriptures, but I've also seen it happen in my own life. So to him that does not try to work righteousness, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, I'm going to talk to you for a second about righteousness and justified. This is a simple way to say it. Righteousness is your standing with God. Before Jesus, (laughs) you're on the outside looking in, my friend. You're not right with God, okay? But look, justified because God said so, (laughs) Really and truly, if you looked at the two Greek words, there's like one letter difference between the two. The, the difference is, is that one of them means you're, you're in right standing with the God. The other one means that God said you're in right standing with God. So, so in other words, God throughout the beginning, he says, in the garden, scholars call it the proto-evangelium, the first proclamation of the gospel when he tells the serpent, the seed of the woman will crush your head. First time the gospel's ever been preached, God preaches it in the garden. The seed of the woman will crush your head. And then he goes through this whole process of calling Abraham out and through this one man creating a whole nation. And through this, one, this nation, he gives us Jesus. And then whenever Jesus dies on the cross and, he, and then he's resurrected from the dead, he ascends to the Father and the Holy Spirit descends And now the message of Jesus Christ is spoken, and then a willing heart receives. Once your willing heart receives Jesus, now the Father's saying, justified. Because, see, you believed in what I've been doing. My whole plan was to send Jesus here to set people free because I want people to know me. Amen? Amen? That's really what it's about. God's creating a kingdom. Do you know that God created you because he wants you to have a relationship with him? I know I'm getting deep. It's getting late. Look, God is love. God is love. Is that not what the Bible says? Can God be love all by himself? Yeah. (laughs) But what is love without someone to love? And then if you're going to love somebody, you want somebody to love you back. He wants somebody to willingly love you back. You don't have to manipulate them with money and, and material possessions. Oh, if you love me, then I'm going to hook you up. No. You want, people to, you want people to want to love you. God wants people with a free will to want to love him. All right. And whenever you do bow your knee, then guess what? God says, oh, fine. 
I've been waiting, so now I declare you innocent. I declare you righteous because now you've put your faith in the Son. All right, Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I meant to grab my little capes in the back. I got a white one and a black one. See, the first time whenever you're wearing this little cape, I probably could go grab that, but I'm not going to do it. You're covered in the sin of Adam. But then whenever you get born again, we don't have time to get into baptize right now. We'll get into that when we get to Romans 6. But the word baptize is not really talking about water right there. Yes, water baptism is a sign of what happens spiritually. But when you're born of Adam, you're walking around with this black cape on because you're born in sin. But when you give your heart to Jesus, you shed the cape, the black one and you put on a white one because now you're clothed in Christ and you're clothed in the righteousness of of Jesus. Amen. Still kind of early. Maybe we could get the musicians to head up here and we could go out of this place worshiping the Lord. I know it last time Naya called me out because we had a we got a music group and I told Aaron to cue up some music. But she's right. All right. Romans 5:17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. I wish I really had time to talk about this, but look, Romans 5, five different times from what I remember the word gift is used. Five times the word gift is used. You hear me? I'm about to close. You'll be home in 30 minutes. Five times the word gift is used, and now we're told what it is. What is the gift? Righteousness. The gift of righteousness. See, Jesus was the righteous one. And when he died on the cross, he gives you and I the opportunity to partake in his righteousness. Now, real quick, I just want to, this is what I'm closing with. Righteousness means right standing. When you give your heart to the Lord, you are now in Christ. That is your position that is your right standing. But can I tell you that Christianity is a process, my friend. And sanctification takes time. And sometimes our position is right here seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. But our condition is down here. God's wanting to bring our condition up to our position. And that is the progressive concept of sanctification. Where as we keep our faith in Christ... The Lord, through his spirit, causes us to look more like Jesus and less like us. Next week, we're going to talk about sin, the noun of sin, the sinful nature. Tonight, we're closing out, singing about Jesus, thanking him for his righteousness. Amen. If you need prayer, I want you to know the altars are open. Think about that tomorrow. Think about that Jesus paid a high price so that you could be a partaker of his righteousness. If you don't know the Lord, amen, you can accept him as your Lord and Savior tonight, amen.